Elon Musk now says he's ready to join a second Trump administration. Musk proposed a committee to cut government spending during his sit-down conversation with Trump on X. Um, that being said, it's not so easy. Elon Musk did it once uh, the first time around with President Trump, and it was, did not long last uh, too long. He left that committee quite quickly, as you know. Elon Musk is the only man who can defy a world where truth seems more manipulated than facts. He's not just a tech mogul. He's become the voice many believe could expose government overreaches. In recent revelations, Musk suggests something sinister lurking beneath official narratives. Why is the government so anxious to silence him? Join us. This isn't just about technology. It's about the battle for truth. A leader emerges from turmoil. As Elon Musk challenges the status quo, America watches closely. The more he speaks out, the more the establishment seems to push back. After a controversial tweet caught fire online, Musk's assertion that freedom of speech is at risk resonated with millions. What is it that they fear he'll reveal next? Stay tuned as we peel back the layers of this gripping narrative. When Trump stood up, bloodied from the shot, and raised his hand, Tucker saw him differently. He didn't just see a man or a candidate, he saw a true leader. Tucker even wondered if something divine had a hand in this transformation. When he stood up after being shot in the face, bloodied, and put his hand up, I thought at that moment, this was the leader of a nation. Tucker explained that being called president doesn't mean much on its own. After all, you could call your dog the CEO of a big company, but that doesn't make it true. You could even put a mannequin in the president's seat if you manipulated things enough. As the election neared, Trump showed himself to be a real leader. Tucker spoke with Trump just hours after the shooting. To Tucker, this showed not just Trump's courage, but also that he wasn't the selfish person the media often made him out to be. But this wasn't the most surprising part. Tucker saw this as a remarkable example of responsible leadership, maybe the best he had ever seen. He thought back on Trump's public life, from his first presidential campaign to now, and saw a consistent message. A leader's duty is to his people and his country. In a true democracy, the people truly own their country, not just as renters or bystanders, but as rightful owners. And they need leaders who truly represent their hopes and dreams. Politicians are supposed to listen to what the people want, or at least try to. But what happens if they ignore what people want for not just a short time, but for decades, say, 50 years? You could argue that this kind of system isn't really a democracy anymore. Interestingly, when Donald Trump came onto the scene, he was accused of being anti-democratic, but his main goal was actually to bring back true democratic values by paying attention to what the American people really wanted. Washington feels distant and disconnected, with politicians seeming to ignore the serious problems their constituents face. Instead, they focus on things like foreign aid. In recent years, we've seen more American lives lost than even during World War II, but our leaders don't seem eager to address this crisis. We know where the drugs are coming from. Our military used to spend billions to disrupt similar routes in other countries, but now our leaders aren't even suggesting using our military to protect our own country. It feels like our leaders are disrespecting the American people, almost as if they're showing contempt. Whatever people say about Donald Trump, he genuinely cares about American citizens. He sees it as his duty, much like a father cares for his family or a commander cares for his troops. This commitment was clear during a heated debate and a rally in Butler. Even those who were skeptical began to feel that something more meaningful was happening beyond just politics. In 2018, the day after the midterm elections, a politically motivated group came to my house. My wife was home alone, scared, hiding in the pantry while they tried to break in. It was a terrifying experience, even caught on camera. During this chaos, Donald Trump personally reached out to offer his support. He wanted to show that despite all the hate, there's still deep love and unity. He even offered to personally stand guard outside our home, a gesture that showed his readiness to protect not just us, but the values we hold dear. New challenges arise, stirring deep personal and political debates. The personal struggles in political unrest. 
But this wasn't the worst part. As the events unfolded, it became clear that the challenges we face are not just political, but deeply personal, affecting our daily lives. It seems like you provided a mix of two different narratives or stories. The first part appears to be a first-hand account of a dangerous situation, possibly an assassination attempt, where the narrator narrowly escapes harm due to a quick reflex. The second part introduces commentary from public figures like Elon Musk and Nigel Farage on different issues related to fame, security, and societal tensions. The country there is an increasing concern that the unique qualities that define the nation are gradually diminishing. This anxiety has sparked a new surge of violence, reminiscent of the intensity witnessed during the racial justice protests following the death of George Floyd in 2020. During those times, the then Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, had shown solidarity with the demonstrators by kneeling, despite the associated damages to police property and historical monuments. However, the current wave of protests presents a different scenario. This time, the participants are predominantly white working-class British citizens. It is emphasized that support for violent protests is explicitly disavowed. Right now, Starma is trying to control what is said, especially on social media. It's important to prevent hate speech or calls to violence online. Most people would agree with that. Farage, however, believes our young people need to be taught how to recognize and challenge extreme views and false information. While social media should allow for speculation and questioning, it's hard to guarantee that every statement is entirely accurate. What seems true today might be questioned tomorrow. With Starma's new strict policies on speech, Farage sees this as one of the biggest threats to free expression we've ever faced. I don't support street violence. I don't support thuggery in any way at all. But I'm worried not just about the events in Southport, but about societal decline that is happening in our country. Elon Musk has also expressed worries about Starma's approach, predicting that the public might not react well. There's even a new idea being discussed that would teach children as young as five to spot radical content and misinformation, using critical thinking to tell truth from lies. While critical thinking is important, if kids are taught that questioning things like environmental policies or immigration is wrong, it could create a future where free debate is suppressed, leading to a society that limits democratic freedoms. Farage is particularly worried that the Labour Party, which leans to the left, might use this situation to weaken our freedoms and restrict free speech. He believes that the unrest we're seeing on the streets today would have been much less severe if there had been transparency from the beginning. After certain tragic events, the chaos was made worse by wild speculation online about the background and motives of those involved, which the authorities didn't address. Farage, who raised these questions publicly, has been accused of inciting violence but he argues that being honest from the start could have calmed things down. Now, with growing criticism and some people on the left calling for his arrest, Farage insists that honesty is crucial in our online world. Additionally, the way platforms like Facebook often overshadow factual posts shows a bigger problem, selective information sharing and biased control over what stories are told. But this isn't the worst part. If this trend continues, we could be facing even more significant challenges to our freedoms in the near future. Beyond the channel, a battle for narrative control intensifies. The Challenge of the English Channel Crossing the English Channel in a small boat presents significant challenges, yet there exists an even more perplexing issue for those interacting with certain social media updates. They frequently find their accounts blocked. It appears as though this blocking is intentional, aimed at controlling the narratives that can be shared publicly. Tensions escalated during the national lockdowns, through which three distinct phases were endured. By the time the second and third lockdowns were implemented, frustration had reached a peak. Comparisons were drawn to regions like Florida and Sweden, which were managing the situation differently. However, merely questioning the lockdown strategies or hinting that the government might be overreaching often resulted in temporary social media account suspensions. This is the real issue. Even after some serious and violent protests, if the government and big tech companies use these events as an excuse to shut down important conversations, 
then we have to ask ourselves, what does this mean for our democratic values? Despite everything, V is still committed to speaking out against all forms of street violence and disorder. It's been a tough few days seeing street violence in our country like we haven't seen in a long time. Sure, we had riots back in 2011 with a lot of looting, but this situation feels very different. Scenes where individuals set fire to hotels housing migrants, the acts defy defense. With people still inside these buildings, the aggression reaches a critical point of moral conflict. Despite an understanding of the widespread frustration and anger in the community, involvement in street protests or acts of violence remains off the table. For three decades, involvement in the electoral process has been a steadfast belief in resolving issues. The conviction lies in addressing societal challenges through peaceful, democratic means, steering clear of violence and upheaval. But here's the thing. This isn't just happening in the UK. Many other European countries are also dealing with a big increase in illegal immigration. This issue causes just as much frustration and financial stress in other parts of the EU because of the strain it puts on local communities. The Irish, for example, are feeling it hard. The real victims of mass illegal immigration are Europe's working-class citizens who have to bear the financial burden, which keeps falling more and more on the taxpayers in these areas. When we look at how governments are responding, consider what Tim Walls did in Minnesota. He extended various services and got a lot of backlash, especially for overlooking the needs of the people born in the country who are really feeling the impact, particularly those with lower incomes. It's the lower-income Europeans and Americans who are most affected by mass illegal immigration, making it a key issue in elections focused on the economy and immigration policies. Just recently, a large protest took place outside the Reform UK headquarters, with people holding Stand Up to Racism signs and directly targeting Nigel Farage. Many people blame Reform UK and Farage for the recent riots and violence. But a spokesperson for Reform UK pointed out that their office on Victoria Street has just been a mailing address for several years now. They've had to take these security steps because of past invasions by extremist left-wing groups, which have forced them to increase security to keep their staff safe. At the protest, a wide mix of people showed up, and it was pretty ironic because thousands of left-wing activists were blaming Farage for inciting riots that he actually tried to prevent. Among the protesters were members from various international leftist groups who saw this as an important gathering to oppose what they see as a growing far-right threat in England. This event is just a small part of the bigger picture and shows the ongoing political tensions in England and beyond. It's a strong reminder of how complex our discussions about democracy, freedom, and how we handle challenges in society really are. As political tides shift, old and new faces vie for influence. Trump's surprising ascendancy. Today's discussions on Capitol Hill, it was evident that opinions varied widely. Concerns about the nation's future were at the forefront of everyone's mind. Amid these concerns, a sense of unity was palpable. President Trump instilled a wave of energy and excitement with his presence in the morning, a sentiment echoed across the party on a national scale. The meeting unfolded in an entirely positive atmosphere, with every participant dedicated to restoring America's former glory. Despite some predictions that legal challenges in past years might diminish their resolve, these challenges have, in fact, fortified their determination. Trump now appears to be gaining an advantage. With nearly a decade of political experience under his belt, he is now viewed as the front-runner, with experts assigning him a 66% likelihood of victory. Betting markets and analysts are also showing robust support for his candidacy. Trump is gaining ground even in states that usually vote Democratic. For instance, he's leading by over 5% in Nevada, and is closing the gap with Biden in Minnesota. In Maine, a state Republicans haven't won in 36 years, Trump is currently ahead. While the future is still uncertain, Trump is in the strongest position he's ever been. If these trends continue, he might lead the Republican Party to take control of both the White House and Congress. Even big business leaders, 
who kept their distance after the events following George Floyd's death, are now getting ready for Trump's possible second term. They're quickly showing their support, despite warnings to donors not to support him after the 2020 election and January 6th events. The financial backing for Trump is remarkable. People are eager to see him wherever he goes, and he's strategically visiting places that usually vote Democratic. This weekend, he plans to visit Detroit, a city where Biden won by a large margin in 2020. But this isn't the most surprising part. People in Europe and other parts of the world are also preparing for Trump's potential return. They usually prefer a less assertive American president because it's easier for them to get what they want. However, they know that with Trump, the days of taking advantage of America's generosity are over. Some groups are rushing to secure commitments on international funds before Trump could change the U.S. stance, leading to considerable nervousness among global elites, especially after recent surprises in the EU election. This has created a sense of anxiety and even fear about the future. Politicians from all sides are confused by why so many people are rejecting globalism. They're also struggling to understand why the idea of make America great again is gaining traction, especially among minorities and young people. In response, Democrats are relying on old criticisms that haven't worked well before, like calling Trump a dictator and pointing out how alarming his behavior can be. They stress the shocking reality of a leading presidential candidate openly supporting violence in politics, and they worry about possible unrest as the election nears. According to them, Trump is turning to violence because he doesn't have enough support. This fear of violence isn't baseless. It's a topic that keeps coming up, with many blaming extreme activists and the negative effects of democratic policies. Now, there's a growing push within the Republican Party to acknowledge that Trump's views on the economy, the courts, and immigration were on the mark. He's made noticeable progress, all while keeping things interesting. But this situation isn't new. If we look back to the 1820s and 1830s, when Andrew Jackson was running for president, influential figures like John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay were shaping what became known as the Age of Jackson. Trump's current influence in policy debates is similar to Ronald Reagan's time. If Trump is re-elected, this period might be known as the Age of Trump. If he picks a strong vice president, this new partnership could significantly impact governance and potentially reshape the world with the goal of preserving America for future generations. Political elites and grassroots values clash, shaping future debates. Echoes of J.D. Vance and Trump's vision. If you're an American who feels disconnected from the political elites and aligns with the working class values that built this country, Trump's agenda might resonate with you. His focus on strong national borders, clear nationalism, and a powerful but peaceful national stance is clear. His consideration of J.D. Vance for vice president and the way he's brushing off his legal troubles are signs that could give hope to his supporters. But here's the twist. While today's discussion might dive into the major stories from the RNC, the choice of J.D. Vance has already sparked significant debate. Critics argue that Vance's aggressive style and divisive rhetoric suggest that Trump has no plans to adopt a more inclusive approach. They see Vance as a polarizing figure in American politics, one who deepens divisions rather than building bridges. Critics in the media quickly dismiss Vance without really addressing what he or Trump stands for, focusing instead on personal attacks. However, Vance's life story, as told in his memoir Hillbilly Elegy and its film adaptation, strikes a chord with many. His journey from a tough upbringing surrounded by addiction and poverty to finding success in law and politics tells a deeply American story of perseverance. But this choice is particularly concerning for establishment figures who prefer policies that benefit China because Vance's alignment with Trump's America First philosophy threatens their interests. As the Biden campaign engages on platforms like TikTok, despite security warnings, the political scene is filled with strategic and contentious decisions that could shape the country's future. During his presidency, the use of TikTok on government phones was prohibited, a policy that the new administration reversed. Concerns about alienating young voters by avoiding engagement on popular platforms like TikTok were dismissed 
citing that despite these shifts, young voters still overwhelmingly favored him as their top choice. This preference, he believed, stemmed from their desire for a competent leader. Observations were made about the opposing candidate's difficulties in public speaking and general mobility, noting instances where the candidate appeared unable to locate stairs that were clearly visible. These comparisons highlighted the contrast in capabilities between the two, reinforcing his confidence in retaining young voter support. The person was considering a total ban on TikTok, aligning with their initial belief that such an action was essential. However, when Congress expressed a different viewpoint, the person chose to respect their decision, even though they remained skeptical about the impact this choice would have. Donald Trump was navigating significant challenges at this time. Known for a sharp sense of humor, the individual acknowledged the mixed reception such humor might receive, especially in pressing times. They recognized the nation's grave situation, which they often highlighted in their speeches, emphasizing the country's decline. Opting not to adopt a comedic persona during the campaign, they aimed to connect authentically with those less engaged in political discourse, understanding the serious context that framed their leadership. We could see up to 18 million undocumented immigrants coming into the country by the end of his term, and that's a huge problem. We don't even know who many of these people are, but it's sure to create major issues. Our focus needs to be on deporting those who pose a danger. Local police are essential in this effort. Take, for instance, the Hindis family, who tragically lost their daughter to an undocumented immigrant. This person had been deported before but managed to come back under the current administration. It's a heartbreaking story, and it's hard to find anything funny about where we are right now. What solutions can we propose for managing undocumented immigration effectively? Your thoughts? If you found this discussion thought-provoking, please like and subscribe for more.